Hi everyone. One of the advantages of being away up here in the attic is I'm able to kind of block out the noise and busyness of everything else that's happening in the house. And yet, in a sense, as we uh, pray to God, as we open ourselves up to hear God's word, we don't want to be shutting out what's going on in the world. Even if what's happening in the world right now uh, leaves us feeling afraid or saddened or frustrated. I found it very hard to follow the news cycle this week and I'm not going to sit and pontificate on it, but I thought it'd be good if we began by hearing words from the mouth of Jesus, words that bring hope, uh, real hope, I think, to those who are vulnerable, but also that brings an almost overwhelming challenge and the reason that these words have any credibility at all is that as we follow the life of Jesus and see his death and everything else beyond, we see that here is someone who didn't just talk the talk, but someone who also walked the walk. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who ill-treat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back do to others as you would have them do to you. My God, full of mercy, heard our weeping, came to bring us home again. My God, takes the broken, makes them whole my God touch the outcast raise the lame man and he calls the blind to see my God takes the broken and makes them whole God stood for justice, shamed the prideful, but he called the sin a friend. My God takes the broken and makes them whole. My God felt the anguish. Of the soldier made his child to live again. My God takes the broken and makes them whole. My God mocked and beaten, crushed and bleeding. Yet crying for 
Father God, forgive my God Became broken to make me whole My God, on the third day In the morning, broke the shackles of the grave my God takes the broken, makes them whole. My God knows my failures, speaks forgiveness, gives me strength to try again. My God. Takes the broken and makes me whole. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. God of eternity, Jesus taught that the meek are blessed. They shall inherit the earth. Help us to live each day with our eyes and hearts fixed on eternity, trusting that in you, daybreak will come, night will flee away. And all this will be right and just. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Genesis chapter 39, reading from verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, This Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. 
but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warder. So the warder put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warder paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Dear Lord, take from us all that distracts and give us what we truly need as we hear your word and as we apply it to our lives. Amen. We've all had a shared experience this year of seeing our plans, sometimes our dreams, uh, going out the window. That's quite disorientating. And for all that we might be glad that we're not somewhere worse, we're not one of the ones in an intensive care unit, we're not one of the people trapped in a refugee camp, we're not caught up in a protest that's turned violent. And yet, it's disorientating because we're not where we might have chosen to be. And in fact, we seem to have very few choices at all. And perhaps we wonder where God is in the midst of all of that. As we trace the story of Jacob's sons and as we increasingly focus on Joseph, we see someone who enjoyed freedoms, responsibilities in their young life, someone who had big dreams, something that's all taken away from him, rudely interrupted by the intervention of his jealous brothers. Joseph is, is torn from the family. He's stripped of all his advantages and he's sold as a slave, taken to Egypt, a distant a foreign place, stripped of all freedom. It's as if someone has pressed reset on his whole life. There he is suddenly in unenviable circumstances, uh, the most unpromising situation. And it's at this point in the musical, uh, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat, that we get the little uh, refrain, Poor, poor Joseph, what you gonna do? Things look bad for you, hey, what you gonna do? And regardless of how in or out of tune uh, that might have been, the question itself is in a sense totally inappropriate. Joseph, newly enslaved, has no choices left open to him. He has no options on the table. Everything is dictated for him. He is someone else's uh, property. And what happens next in the life of Joseph is not so much what Joseph uh, does or resolves to do. It's what God does. And we see that God acts in and through Joseph in an extraordinary way. And even his lowly status uh, as a slave, with all that goes with that, apparent limitations seem to be no constraint on the purposes of God. And the incredible thing is after that sharp, uh, dramatic fall from grace into this unpromising uh, circumstance, against all expectations, Joseph is soon on the up, uh, upwardly mobile with considerable velocity. And there's a sense as we read through this chapter, we see that it's better to be in what looks, and it would have certainly looked this way to Joseph, looks to be the, the wrong place with God than to be anywhere else without God. Of course, to put it like that, it's quite simplistic, even glib, because it smooths out all the wrinkles. You know, even as we know God's presence, as Joseph did, we can have experience, we can be in situations and circumstances that drain us, frustrate us, that, that scare us. And Joseph knew real anguish, real upheaval. 
he's stripped of all the status uh, of the favoured son, of privilege, of responsibility. Well, everything was taken out of his hands. But we see here clearly right from the start that he was still within the hand of God. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. He's in the wrong place. He's not where he would choose to be. But the blessing he receives was not chosen by Joseph either. It was simply given by God. And we see how that blessing touches uh, all of life. Uh, this household uh, flourishes uh, from top to bottom. Uh, Potiphar, uh, the slave owner, knew the blessing of the Lord through Joseph. And Joseph himself again finds himself as the one singled out as the, the favourite, uh, elevated, promoted, trusted, given uh, responsibility and even a measure of authority. Potiphar left everything under Joseph's care. And we're not to read from this that Joseph is one of those uh, rare and enviable people blessed with that cat-like capacity to always land on his feet. No, the key thing, and it couldn't be more explicit, was that the Lord was with him. It seems even his master saw more than someone with unusual talent. Potiphar saw that God was with him and it was through God that the blessing came and so he'd hit rock bottom down in the pits he has uh, risen to a, a new position uh, of uh, responsibility a, a new high a new normal we might say but then things are about to be shattered once more and again, poor Joseph seems to be the, the victim of, of circumstances. Uh, if his first fall was precipitated by his brother's envy, by their jealousy, then his second fall is precipitated by lust, not his own, but of his master's wife. The close of verse 6 uh, sets up the scene. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph. And what follows is a moment of real testing. And there's a lot on the line. And pressed and tested, Joseph does not fail. And the temptation is persistent. Uh, we're told that she spoke to Joseph day after day. And through it all, Joseph is true uh, to his deepest loyalties. He's utterly consistent and, and actually when it comes to the crunch, when he's really pushed, he's prepared to act uh, decisively. And in this, his uh, behaviour and his attitude in the whole area of sex uh, is in stark contrast to what we discovered in the, in the previous chapter and the self-serving actions and the hypocritical attitude of his older brother Judah. And Joseph's example is instructive for us as well. You know, we live in this uh, absolutely sex-saturated culture uh, that's full of all these tensions and paradoxes. Sex is that sometimes treated as if it's everything and then it's nothing. It's uh, of all importance and then it's very cheap. It's surrounded with this uh, illusion of freedom and yet so often it's exploitative, causing such deep uh, hurts. So let's pay attention to how Joseph acts and what happens. But for his wife, it's very direct. Having observed something that she wants and desires, there's no cat and mouse, no subtlety. She uh, takes the path of least resistance. She approaches Joseph and says, come to bed with me. If there's something uh, impulsive and, and shallow about that invitation, the response from Joseph is measured and it's, it's mature. With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. 
How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? See, Joseph has his uh, loyalty to his master and his concern to do what is right in the sight of God. And he doesn't bracket off his sex life from either of these things. There's no space in his thinking for a, a sense of entitlement. I've had a few uh, tough breaks. Things have gone against me. Why not indulge this once? There's no self-justification. He doesn't rely on the fact that someone else initiated. It was her idea, her household. She sets the agenda. No, he recognises the trust placed in him by his master and he honours that trust. He recognises the blessing that he's received from God and he wants to honour God. It's almost as if he intuitively picks up the, the folly and the wickedness of adultery. And in his words, he displays uh, wisdom, probably a wisdom beyond his years, uh, and a faithfulness that comes at a cost. Uh, there is integrity here. Now, God has been with Joseph, freely, graciously blessing him without Joseph asking or earning his favour. And now here, for the first time, uh, in this chapter at least, Joseph is presented with a, a real choice. He is the master of his own destiny. He has an open door. He can go through it or he can close it. But Joseph makes his choice and he, he sticks with it. Now, of course, what happens next um, is hard for Joseph. You know, sometimes nice guys finish last. And the immediate consequence of his faithfulness is the complete deterioration of the situation he's enjoying. Uh, Potiphar's wife is not deterred uh, by Joseph's uh, rejecting her advances. She, she bides her time, she picks her moment, and she finds a moment when the house is empty. And that might remove some of the obstacles, I suspect she imagines. No one needs to know. There needn't be any uh, cost or consequence for anyone. But in that moment, uh, Joseph again, where his words have been ignored, he simply acts, he, he just gets out of there, uh, shedding his cloak in the process. And from there, everything turns sour. Uh, Potiphar's wife, uh, jilted, uh, turns to spite. And so she spins her story. It's her words uh, against his, the word of an insider against the word of that Hebrew. And that struck me in a new way in the context of what's happening in our world this week as people fill the streets, um, sickened by injustice, things that have been wrong and wrong in a profound way for a long time suddenly bubbling up. And in this ancient story, we just get a sense of how unoriginal and how ugly uh, prejudice is. Twists truth that tilts the scales, it gives uh, a weight and a, and a force to our worst instincts. And it all plays out. And just as Joseph's brothers had presented this blood-stained coat uh, to, to Jacob, Potiphar, his wife, presents Joseph's cloak, accompanied by the incriminating story. In both situations, Joseph had been the favoured one. And Jacob was moved to tears, for he thought Joseph was dead. And Potiphar burned with anger, because he thought Joseph, his trusted lieutenant, had betrayed him. And both, in fact, were duped by a lie. And both saw Joseph torn from the heart of their households. So Joseph hits a new low. He begins life as a disgraced prisoner still a very long way from home, still a very long way from the fulfilment of any of his dreams that must have seemed now so naive. Once again, life reset, once again, unenviable circumstances, an unpromising situation. Poor, poor Joseph, what you gonna do? 
But then the account of Joseph's time in prison seems to reprise his early days in Potiphar's house. The pattern is exactly the same. The Lord is with Joseph. And though he seems on the surface of things to be in the wrong place, in unenviable, ugly circumstances, Joseph prospers. He earns trust, admiration. He's given responsibility and even success. But the point here is not of what Joseph can make of trying circumstances. The point is what God can and will make of Joseph through this young man who seems to attract uh, trouble and calamity and disaster wherever he goes. It is through him that God is working out his purposes and promises. And Joseph has had the toughest of tough breaks, falsely imprisoned on false charges. And yet even then, God is with Joseph in a meaningful way, a way that makes a difference. See, one way to misread this story would be simply to focus purely on Joseph and on his capabilities and his uh, achievements. And perhaps we might even be intimidated if we did that. Uh, Perhaps our lives bear scant resemblance to his uh, youthful energy, his good looks, his bounce back ability, his capacity to uh, earn trust, his unimpeachable morality seems so earnest, so pure. But actually the narrator, as the story is told, points us elsewhere. See, without God, Joseph's story is actually a, a dead end. It's a tragic fall from favour. But with God, it seems that almost irrespective of circumstance and situation, even hatred or an injustice, do not deter or exhaust or extinguish the grace of God. Recently, when we were looking at 1 Corinthians 15, We saw the Apostle Paul, another figure that we might be tempted to to lift up on a a pedestal. Here is a a hero of the faith. But Paul is acutely conscious of all the things that might make him a a villain in the eyes of others. Perhaps also things that might put him on that pedestal unwisely. What does he say? He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, with me. The Lord was with Joseph. See, there's much about our current circumstances and our situation as we grind our way through 2020 that might make us feel frustrated that might make us feel like we have anything uh, but freedom. We might even long before lockdown have um, felt ourselves staggering into 2020 under the weight of baggage uh, from the past, things that have not gone right, areas in which we've failed. We might look around ourselves right now, take stock, say, well, I don't like this. I don't like these circumstances. I don't want this uh, situation. There might be a sense of loss and disappointment that goes way deeper than any cancelled holiday. And yet, as we look at this story in God's word, we find it pushing us to ask, is there a sense in which whatever is going on, we can say, is God not still faithful? There's a challenge to look for God, even if we think we're in completely the wrong place. Even if we know we're not where we want to be, if we're not sure how to move forward as we seem to uh, stumble, tripping over obstacles or even our own feet as we face whatever lies ahead. Joseph found himself in unpromising, unchosen, unwanted, unenviable circumstances. 
He was in the wrong place. And yet the Lord was with him. And that proved to be enough. Psalm 37 uh, says this. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. God our Father, as we read your word, we see men and women doing things that are unkind, that are unwise, that are unfair. We see the complete and utter mess that they make. And yet as we look to ourselves, as we consider our own hearts and our own actions and the words that come from our mouth, we see that we're not so different. We thank you that in Jesus Christ you have not recoiled from us or condemned us, but have drawn close to us in the midst of the mess that we make and have made it possible for us to enjoy friendship with you, knowing your presence and your peace that passes all understanding. Through Jesus Christ, we now ask you to draw close to all those who find themselves alone and struggling at this time. We ask that you would bring healing and wholeness that you would grant wisdom to those who find themselves faced with important and difficult decisions, that you would grant patience to those who find themselves overstretched and refreshment to the exhausted. In all things, help us to see and to seek your blessing. And to these prayers, we add the words that Jesus has taught us to pray, saying together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands, his feet my saviour on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph Peace the night, and I will rise. 
hands among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name forevermore For endless days we will sing See?